Welcome to this third module on lens. Today we'll be covering acquired cataract, senile, traumatic, systemic diseases, and toxic cataracts. We've already done congenital cataract. So the first most common cataract which you see and which you'll probably exam, get in the exams is a senile cataract. So what are the different three types? One is in the center in which the nucleus is actually involved and then you've got the peripheral area which is the cortex, that's the cortical cataract and third is just in front of the posterior capsule that is called the posterior subcapsular cataract. So going through the different stages of these, the pathogenesis of these cataracts will be hydration. So there's fluid it develops in the lens fibers and causes lens fiber separations followed by coagulation of lens proteins in the cortex. So it occurs in the following stages. First is the stage of lamellar separation. Then you have the incipient cataract, immature senile cataract, mature senile cataract, and hypermature senile cataract. First stage is the stage of lamellar separation. It is demarcation of cortical fibers owing to their separation by fluid is demonstrated on slip lamp and characteristic grayish appearance of the pupil and the changes are reversible in the initial stages. Here you can see the water clefts in the cortex and not involving the nucleus. Then you come on to the stage of incipient cataracts. You get wedge-shaped opacities with clear areas in between which are called the lens stria. Here you can see these and most common in the peripheral and lower nasal quadrant only seen in dilated pupil. So if it's something in the periphery, it is going to be insignificant for vision. So these are cataracts which are insignificant initially. Irregularities in refraction can occur and visual deterioration and polyopia. Because when the pupil is dilated, especially at night time, they can feel doubling of vision, especially if with the dilated pupil, if light passes through these cortical wedge shape opacities, it can produce those. Then we go on to stage of immature senile cataract. Opacifications become more diffuse and irregular. The lens is swollen. The iris shadow still is visible. An anterior chamber becomes shallow. Here you can see that can be immature can be either the nucleus sclerosis happening or the cortical opacities become more diffuse in these cases. Then you go on to a mature senile cataract where there is complete opacification and the whole cortex is involved. The lens appears pearly white in color and is also known as right cataract. At this moment, it is important to clear a notion in the general public that cataract surgery is only done when the pupil becomes ripe, when it's ready to surgery. Unfortunately, this used to be something which was practiced in the time of intracapillar surgery like 20-30 years back when cataract surgery was not so advanced and you would do surgery actually when the patient could no longer see from that eye. So typically those are the patients who would get these type of cataracts, white cataracts or which are called the mature cataracts. The problem with these cataracts was if you waited too long you can see as the lens increases in thickness, it tends to produce the iris to go forward and it can produce angle closure glaucoma. So those are the times then if they did not get it at the right time, they could end up into a phacomorphic glaucoma. Then you've got the hypermature senile cataract. Not all of them will go into phacomorphic glaucoma, some of them cortex disintegrates and liquefies into a pultaceous material. It usually occurs in two forms. One here you can see the cortex is liquefied and the brownish colored nucleus has sunken down in the back. That is called a Morgagnian cataract. While you can get a sclerotic hypermature cataract in which the capsule becomes thick and wrinkled and the cortex remains as such. So the Morgagnian or hypermature cataract is complete cortex is liquefied and appears milky white and nucleus settles down in the bottom, bottom and calcium deposits may be seen on the capsule. So the important thing in the white cataracts is 
when you go in for cataract surgery as soon as you puncture the capsule a white liquid will come out into the interior chamber and obscure your view so what you need to do at that time is let that fluid come out or you can aspirate with a cannula irrigation aspiration cannula until you can get a clear view of the nucleus and these are cataracts which are difficult to do especially with phaco emulsification probably doing them with extra capsular cataract extraction is much simpler in sclerotic hypermature cataracts there's disintegrated cataract there's shrunken lens wrinkle anterior capsule dense white capsular cataract in the pupillary area deep anterior chamber and tremulousness of the iris because of the shrinkage of the edge of the lens the lens tends to become smaller in size and can be tremulous because it loses its support to the iris that is the reason for that then we go on to a nuclear or a sclerotic cataract so that is different so the earlier cataracts which we discussed were of cortical types so then this is intensification of age related degenerative changes associated with dehydration and compaction of nucleus so it is like a bark of a tree as the years go by there's one layer second layer third layer fourth layer keeps on so similar is the nucleus of the human lens the important thing is the human lens keeps proliferating throughout the life of the patient if you do cataract surgery you still can get abortive lens fibers from the equator that is the area from where the proliferation of the lens cells happens the features of a nucleus sclerotic cataract are there's a hard cataract is formed significant increase in water insoluble proteins lens becomes inelastic and lose power of accommodation changes begin centrally and slowly spread to the periphery deposition of pigment gives characteristic color usually it's a urochrome that's a pigment which gets secreted and gives that yellowish appearance at the end or the advanced stages it gives a brownish appearance and it is called a cataracta nigra or a blackish type of a cataract so those are the type of cataracts in which the nucleus actually becomes very hard in cortical cataracts the nucleus is not very hard what do you mean by hardness hardness would be if you were to hold the lens and to squish it it would be very easy to squish a cortical cataract but it will be very the you will feel that it's more of a stony uh, or a appearance or stony feeling to a nuclear hard cataract the problem with hard cataract with newer technology is when you're doing phaco emulsification it takes a lot of energy for the machine to break that nucleus so nowadays we tend to do cataract surgery at an earlier stage so that the patient is one number one rehab rehabilitated early and the second is he does not get more inflammation in the eye during cataract surgery the second thing with nucleus sclerotic cataract is because of the compaction the refractive power of the lens is enhanced so light coming in they'll be focusing further anterior to the retina and the patient will become slightly myopic so patients who are hypermetropic they will feel that their vision has actually improved they can do without glasses and they feel this is something god given or something which has happened with age the important thing is these patients tend to have or maintain good vision till the very end a cortical cataract probably starts later but it tends to produce visual complaints as soon as it comes in the visual axis then we come on to the complications of senile cataract as phaco anaphylactic uveitis lens induced glaucoma and subluxation or dislocation of the lens phaco anaphylactic reaction or one is phaco lytic glaucoma there are two different things but i'll just go I've discussed it earlier in glaucoma lecture so i'll just say when the lens proteins leak into the anterior chamber the liquefied proteins they can leak into the anterior chamber they will incite an inflammatory reaction in the anterior chamber leading to uveitis and formation of a hypopion 
and then obviously due to leak proteins you get secondary glaucoma so you say, see a hazy cornea white pupillary reflex and a hypopion that is a phacolytic glaucoma while on the other hand if you see a white pupil and a hazy cornea that means that the patient has got phacomorphic glaucoma and here you can see the lens is actually dislocated into the anterior chamber there are two entities one is dislocation and one is subluxation of the lens which need to be clarified subluxation means that the zonules are still attached to the lens and it can go back into its place while dislocation means that it is a free floating structure and it can either be in the anterior chamber or it can fall back into the posterior chamber or the posterior segment Then we move on to pre-senile cataract. Cataract which occur earlier in patients. These include accelerated aging, Down syndrome, diabetes, miscellaneous such as myotonic dystrophy. Christmas tree cataract is one of the features in that. Here you can see a Christmas tree cataract and you can get atopic dermatitis as well which can cause early cataract. We move on to traumatic cataract. One can be a concussive or a voceous ring. So this is the lens. When you've got trauma, the cornea is going to, if somebody presses on the cornea, the cornea is going to go back and that pushes the iris on the surface of the lens. And that hard contact of the iris with the surface produces that imprint of the pupil on the lens which leaves its pigment over there it's just like a rubber stamp being pressed onto something and that is called a voceous ring that is a concuss concussive cataract then you get ionizing radiations such as doses as low and as 200 rads may cause cataracts then you can get electric shock including lightning high tension electricity presumably causes heating or ionization anterior and posterior subcapsular cataract with coarse fern-like appearance so you can see this looks like more of a fern-like appearance and it is in the posterior subcapsular region then we have another entity which is which is interesting which is called an infrared or a glass blower's cataract there is true exfoliation of the lens capsule, splitting or delamination of the anterior aspect of the lens capsule. So if this is, this is a capsule, it splits into two parts which can happen. Gas cataract, injury by dehydration secondary to vitreoretinal surgery occur within 24 hours seen as feathering on the posterior subcapsular aspect of the lens. Here you can see a gas cataract. So there are two entities. One is a glass grower cataract and one is a gas. Gases such as sulfur hexafluoride or C3F8 are used for after retinal detachment surgery to give internal tamponade to the lens. They tend to produce a temporary cataract which tends to go away when the gas is absorbed. Now we come on to exfoliation. So we came to know about true exfoliation, which is superficial zonal lamella of the capsule split from the deeper layer. And exposure to infrared radiation is the cause, and the main cause is a glass blower's cataract. While pseudo exfoliation means that it's basement membrane like fibrillogranular white material deposited on the lens, iris, ciliary body, trabecular meshwork, cornea anterior hyoid face and zonular fibers is present so the importance of zodo exfoliation is number one it can be associated with glaucoma of secondary type because the pseudo exfoliated material tends to deposit in the lens as well the second these patients zonules are become weak and when you're doing cataract surgery they can get zonular dehiscence meaning the zonules can break and then lens can tumble down back into the vitreous cavity. So you have to be very careful doing surgery for these patients. Then we come on to a traumatic cataract. We can be a perforated injury. We've already done the concussion, which is a voceous ring. The typical cataracts which are produced with contusion is rosette shape opacity, subluxation and dislocation. Because if you hit something with a trauma the, the lens will shake the
the zonules will be stretched they can either break from inferiorly or superiorly or it can break totally and fall down then we already did radiation injury which includes ionizing radiation infrared radiation and uv radiation chemical injury which is alkali or caustic burn chalcosis produces a sunflower cataract and siderosis is something which is due to iron deposition and this is here you see these reddish spots these are of siderosis this is a patient in which you see the lens is actually sinking down that is called a subluxation it is not totally fallen down this is a voceous ring which you see and this is the rosette shaped cataract which you see in patients with trauma so next category of cataract is drug induced and systemic diseases we come on to steroids which can be systemic and topical and cataractogenic dose is unclear so patients typically patients with asthma they might be taking steroids or patients with renal transplant they might be taking steroids so you need to ask their history if they are taking steroids they will tend to get glaucoma so if you see cataract in a 30 year old patient you ask them history about any steroid intake chlorpromazine produces yellow brown granules under the lens capsule plus retinal damage while myotic especially anticholinesterase can produce the cataract this is typically a verticillata which you tend to get with amiodrone which is a drug used for hypertension so this is 50% developed lens opacities which are called corneal verticillata usually they are visually insignificant but you tend to see them gold causes anterior capsular lens opacities and bucellin also causes cataract this is typically a steroid induced cataract and what type of cataract do you see this is small opacity in the center or which is enlarged so you do not see cortical wedges or spokes and you do not see any grayish or greenish appearance here so this is typically a posterior subcapsular cataract you see in these patients then you come on to diabetic cataracts diabetic senile cataracts develop at an earlier age and are rapidly progressive compared to non diabetics while snowflake anterior and posterior opacities due to osmotic overhydration these are the snow foliage cataracts this may be due to high concentration of glucose and sorbitol which we have discussed before then we move on to metabolic cataracts they are metabolic diseases such as galactokinase deficiency which produces a systemically unwell causes pre senile cataracts menocidosis is an autosomal recessive inheritance there is deficiency of alpha menocidose and the accumulation of menos rich oligosaccharides they produce spoke like posterior capsular opacities then we've come on to fabry's disease is x links lipid storage disease due to lysosomal deficiency of alpha galactosidase is pro progressive accumulation of glycosphingolipids in the blood vessels so we go into the detail of these diseases galactosemia is a condition in which the body is unable to process galactose the sugar present in milk this accumulation of excessive galactose in the body can cause many problems such as liver damage producing jaundice kidney damage brain damage brain retardation and cataract and the treatment is avoid lactose on to galactosemia is an autosomal recessive disease which we've discussed before it is galactokinase deficiency in earlier stage the cataract happens in late childhood and early in the early stages there are very few systemic finding as there is galactose 1 phosphate uridyl transferase deficiency this failure of to thrive diarrhea and jaundice hepatosplenomegaly in the first few months of life The important thing to remember if you get an MCQ the type of cataract which you have in these patients is an oil droplet cataract with so progress progress to maturity within a few months will resolve if early treatment is given. Then we move on to Fabry's disease. So if you use the acronym of Fabry it's easy to remember. You can get febrile episodes in this, you get angiokeratomas, you get burning pain 
renal failure, youth death, ceramide trihexoside accumulation, and cardiovascular disease. So these are the angiokeratomas which are present due to alpha-galactosidase A enzyme deficiency. Then we move on to low syndrome, which is also called the oculocerebrorenal syndrome. It's X-linked with renal failure and mental retardation. You can get also joint dislocation. And we've got Wilson's disease, which is autosomal recessive inheritance. This deficiency of cerebelloplasmin causes copper deposition. And this copper deposition occurs in the cornea and in the lens. The lenticular deposition produces sunflower cataracts, which are rare. But typically, if somebody would send you for Wilson's disease, they ask you to look for caser flesher rings, which are present at the level of the decimase membrane or at the deeper layer in the periphery of the cornea. Hypocalcemia produces small, discrete white flecks or crystals. So this is typically a sunflower cataract. So you produce that big center area and these are the radiating spokes of the sunflower. This is a caser flesher ring, which you see this is the goldenish yellowish appearance on the peripheral cornea, which happens due to deposition of copper. So Wilson's disease will affect the eyes. So the patients will have kidney disease, cardiac disease, affect bones and affect the central nervous system. So then you go on to chronic hypogalcemia. The cataract is you get brittle nails with transverse grooves, decrease or absent axillary and pubic hair and you get dry skin. This is Lowe's or oculocerebrorenal syndrome in which you have ocular occurs exclusively in males, short stature, congenital cataract and infantile glaucoma as well. You get delayed development with normal to marked intellectual impairment, seizures. So this is the cerebral part of it, neonatal hypotonia that is with, associated with neuronal maldevelopment and renal Fanconi syndrome you get low molecular weight proteinuria amino acid urea bicarbonate wasting renal tubular acidosis phosphatoyuria hypercalciuria sodium and potassium wasting and polyuria so those are mostly renal symptoms which you are getting in these patients then there is secondary cataracts which occur due to a disease inside the eye so Systemic disease is different. Secondary cataract would be due to uveitis, which produces anterior and posterior subcapsular opacities. Usually in uveitis, there's leakage of lens proteins and cells in the anterior chamber, and the iris tends to stick to the surface of the lens, which is called a posterior synechy. At that point, when a vascular structure like the iris is sticking on the lens, it produces opacities in that area. Secondary cataract can also happen due to high myopia. Acute angle pleurotic glaucoma produces small opacities in the anterior capsule, which are called glaucom flecken. Then hereditary retinal diseases, which include retinitis pigmentosa, characteristically have posterior subcapsular cataracts, Leber's congenital amaurosis gyrate atrophy, Stickler syndrome, and Wagner's. You've got myotonic dystrophy, which produces frontal balding, cataract, ptosis, hatchet faces due to atrophy of the temporal muscles, and delayed grip release. Ocular associations of atopic dermatitis, both skin and the crystalline lens, are derived from the ectoderm. Characteristic bilateral anterior and posterior stellate opacities are formed. You can get a shield-like cataract, atopic keratoconjunctivitis, and keratoconus due to constant rubbing of the eye is seen in atopic dermatitis. Maternal infections are a very important cause of cataract, which include congenital rubella, toxoplasmosis, CMV, which includes cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex, syphilis, varicella, and HIV. The congenital rubella syndrome which we've already discussed is has a triad of cataract, cardiac abnormalities, and deafness. Other manifestations include growth retardation, rash, hepatosplenomegaly, 
jaundice, meningoencephalitis, and CNS defects. Maternal drug infections, thalidomide, in which the patient's children or the mothers had children born with absence of their limbs that was due to thalidomide. Corticosteroid intake by mother can also cause cataracts and warfarin intake by mother as well. Then we come on to hereditary cataract because initially in our start we said one third of the congenital cataracts are hereditary as well. Usually autosomal dominant but may have different genes have been implicated. Some recessive genetic defects which causes sporadic cataract. Others are linked to syndromes such as trisomy, which is Down syndrome, or myotonic dystrophy. So in conclusion, cataract is a leading cause of preventable blindness in the world, and understanding the different types of cataracts is essential for planning treatment. So out of these, cataractosemia is one thing. If you pick it up early and change or treat the patient, you will revert this condition. Diabetes, you can slow the progression of diabetic cataracts with good control. That is one thing. Hypocalcemia is something which can be controlled. Steroids, which we take, they can be taken in a certain amount. Steroid taken in less than 10 or 5 milligrams tend to have minimal side effects. So there are the different things if you know about these you can monitor or alter them to get a delay in the onset of cataract. Why is it important for the patient to have a delay in cataract? If a patient undergoes cataract surgery, the one thing which he loses after cataract surgery is his ability to accommodate. So normally a fixed focus lens, which is used in 70 to 80% of the population, does not give you accommodation. Now we've got refractive IULs such as multifocal IULs, they can accommodate, but their mechanism is totally different. So it's good that the patient can avoid these things and remain in good health before he really needs a cataract surgery. Thank you very much for listening. Subscribe to our channel to get the latest update on the latest lectures. Thank you very much for watching.